it's Sunday, January 10th, 2021. Only 10 more days of the Trump presidency. My name is Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. That makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. I might have gotten the days wrong. <laughs> Welcome to Comes Out Loud, the Bear Podcast, and enjoy the length episode number 586. It is the 20th. <laughs> yes. Which is how many days away? Today's the 10th, and it's 20th, which nope. is 10 days, right? Today's nope. the 17th, honey. The, I'm raining right off the sheet. <clears throat> you sure? Yes, it says the 10th. It said the 10th until... And <laughs> Gary changed it. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me to read from that section, and that's what I read from that section. Hey, you know what? I want to. I want to say this. If there is anything about this podcast, it is authentically human. <laughs> it makes mistakes. It fucks things up. We apologize. We try to make corrections, and we move on. So we now it's only three more days of the Trump presidency. So. <laughs> In any case, we have an authentic guest with us, uh, uh, Mr. Angelini Cook, a resident uh, ed, uh, sex therapist. Thank you for joining us. Hey, hey thank you. So, uh, Ed, welcome to a non-sex <laughs> topic, so to speak. Um, but I do uh, think it's awesome that we're having you on here because I had been the one that reached out to Dad about this topic. Um, so uh, to give a little bit of background, this is going to seem probably very strange for some people in a way. There is a um, YouTube personality who made a choice to no longer produce uh, videos and actually took pretty much all their content down. Um, and their name is Jenna Marbles. And I was introduced to them by some dear friends of mine, and I've been watching for years. And then uh, last year, a decision was made to take it down. YouTube's a logarithm months later suggests this video um, about Jenna Marbles and the end of authenticity. And I found it really intriguing, this whole concept about how um, digital media, especially like YouTube, is kind of like a time capsule but if people don't take stock of the breadth like the whole of the content and they only take a slice of it so to speak then they're missing like growth context like you know um the fact that time has passed all these different kind of things and anyway so i'd send it to ed and i was kind of like what do you, have you seen this what do you think about it so we had this little thing kind of going on um in terms of that so that was kind of the the background we'll include the link to the to the jenna marbles uh youtube video but i uh i really found it intriguing the idea about um how we now live in a different time and how we view people and whether we would kind of consider things that they do authentic or not mm. Um, and and that like the definition that we have for authenticity for YouTube creators um, is dependent on one thing um, mm -hmm. and that like we don't allow them to grow. We don't allow them to or we're, we're not we're not bringing into context their their progress. Um, and the one thing that I really liked about the video was um, the fact that it kind of talks about the YouTube creators deleting content. Um, like is reducing their authenticity very similar to like us possibly like ripping up pages in a diary um, mm. so you're only seeing the stuff that they want um, and I made an allusion to um, kind of like uh, Hamilton with um, Eliza when she mm -hmm. rips up her letters and burns them um, she's taking herself out of the narrative I thought yeah I think that's um, really cool Mm -hmm. So for those of you that don't speak musical theater, Hamilton <laughs> is a show that was on Broadway. It was a very big success. And there's a beautiful song in it called Burn. And it is exactly like I had said, like the Alexander Hamilton, the main character, his wife, uh, her correspondence and things seem to have just disappeared from historical record, uh, which is an intriguing concept. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're right, Ed. Like I, I thought that was really interesting. Like um, about how individuals decided to take control of their content because they were being held accountable for past behaviors. And yeah. um, in this case, most of these individuals, I think, that have done this, this is their this is their income. Like this is literally their livelihood. Like how they exist, mm-hmm. have you know a roof over their head, feed themselves, those type of things. Um, and I was just asked actually earlier this morning, no, last night, about this podcast and the length of time I've been involved in it and then what, what we do. And it was interesting because there was a question about like uh, how it's viewed like in terms of like my my relationship with it. And I said, I consider it like a hobby. I said, you know, we are not making money on it like for our livelihoods. It is not our income. If it was, I think we would operate differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and we may find ourselves in the same position, you know, that um, these creators are, that they're being held accountable for behavior eight, 10 years ago. Yeah. And all of our, well, sorry, correction. <laughs> if you listen to our 2020 year review, you know, not all 100% of the COL content is available online. Some of it has unfortunately been lost. And it wasn't because we removed it out of like shame or despair or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, something that happened along the the journey of the, um the archive and that and but it's out there so surely you can go back in previous episodes and pull out some stuff and take it out of context and out of time and be like mm-hmm. ooh ass hole mm-hmm. like you know about anything that any of us said i'm sure you know yeah. cuz and and to be fair in all those episodes that were lost all the show notes are still there it's just mm-hmm. i was dumb and didn't archive some of the those episodes before the service I was using at the time to host our, our podcast decided to take everything down. So, mm. and I only have so much storage space. So, and I, so it's I, an... I I didn't have a, a a backup copy somewhere. So, and this was pre Google Drive and then Dropbox and such like that. So, yeah, and it and it is interesting because. Um, we were watching um, last night a movie that was made in the early 90s, and I was thinking about could this film be remade now, and I was like, no, because there's so much about the lack of technology at the time mm-hmm. that makes this plot point possible. If you add in the internet and the use of cell phones and smartphones, like like mm-hmm. a whole bunch of divergences that happen could just not exist anymore. Like, cause you'd be like, why the fuck did you do that? Why didn't you look this up? It's called a GPS map on your goddamn phone. Like, you know, <laughs> I mean, like, you know, all these things can't happen in that, in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, something else as we move on uh, from the Jenna marbles video um, is they talk about the good place, which I have not seen the series, but I know a number of people did watch it and really enjoyed it. Um, And they talk about in it, um, and thank you for the notes, Ed, that uh, the concept about, like, part of authenticity is, like, you know, not forgetting our progress. Like, like, you know, where an individual comes from and where they are today. That was one of the things I liked about this video is they talk about uh, a definition of authenticity is about seeing the growth, you know, the changes in an individual from you know, X point to Y point or however you want to phrase it in that case. Yeah. So, uh, and then Ed, you have yet once again, blessed us with many notes. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) That's me being super authentic. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, this is one thing we can expect from every episode that we have Ed on is we have extensive notes, which is a good thing. Extensive notes and a lot of references. Um, I mean, you know, that's just that's just how I was trained, right? So, uh, but I'm really glad that we're talking about this um, because, uh, you know, with my business, I I would say like if um, like with my practice, you would probably say that like twenty per probably about thirty percent of my practice is kind of this work and or 30 percent of my practice is sex therapy and like 70 percent of my work is this right it's um it's helping people uh with their authenticity it's helping them kind of get back onto the path of who they are 
um, not the past who they feel like other people um, have expectations about who they are. So, um, so this, a lot of this is my bread and butter and I love this. So like what is important when we talk about authenticity is to mention um, probably the biggest name as far as authenticity research goes. And that's mm -hmm. Brene Brown. Um, if you're not familiar with Brene Brown, uh, she is a social worker and researcher with the University of Houston's Graduate School of Social Work. Um, and she spent the past two decades studying courage, shame, empathy, vulnerability. Um, she is incredible. Um, <laughs> she has a lot of books uh, that talk about um, all of these topics. Um, she has a, a, a killer podcast that um, I included a couple um, a couple of her episodes um, in the notes um, with our future president, uh, Joe Biden, uh, talking about courage and unity and empathy. And then also mm -hmm. another one with Alicia Keys talking about authenticity and vulnerability. And it's really awesome. But mm. um, so in talking about authenticity, the definition that Brene Brown gives is that authenticity is a daily practice living authentically meanings, means cultivating the courage to be emotionally honest to set boundaries and to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, exercising the compassion that comes from knowing that we are all made of light and darkness, strength and struggle, and nurturing the connection and sense of belonging that can only happen when we let go of who we are supposed to be and embrace who we are. Authenticity means wholehearted living and loving even when it's hard, even when it hurts, and especially when we are wrestling with the shame and fear of not being enough. Mindfully practicing authenticity during our most soul-searching struggles is how we invite grace, joy, and gratitude into our lives. So um, basically, in order for us to practice authenticity, we need a few things. We need some courage, we need some compassion, and we need some connection. Uh, and there are certain things that keep us um, for that keep us distant from that, um, namely fear, sympathy, and shame. So fear keeps us distant from courage, where vulnerability gets us closer. Sympathy keeps us distant from cur from compassion, where empathy gets us closer. Mm -hmm. And shame keeps us distant from connection, where vulnerability, empathy, power, and freedom get us closer. So. Um, the V word has been mentioned a few times. So vulnerability um, mm -hmm. is um, another really big Brene Brown word. Um, but that basically means it's not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and to be seen when we have no control over the outcome. Vulnerability is not weakness. It is our greatest measure of courage. Um, one mm -hmm. of the other concepts that Brene Brown uses a lot is the arena and um kind of showing up for your life. And she uses this quote by Theodore Roosevelt, um, and it says that it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in their arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great um, enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly? Um, and one of uh, Brene Brown's books, um, my favorite book, is called Daring Greatly. Um, so, in, um, you know, I know that you all know that a lot of my practice is working with the LGBTQIA population. And this is something that I have shared with my clients. And if you're my client and I haven't shared this with you, I really apologize. I will send it to you momentarily. But... <laughs> um, but this is something that comes up a lot. And um, there was this... A uh, person on Twitter, Alexander Leon, and he 
um, tweeted that queer people don't grow up as ourselves. We grow up playing a virgin version of ourselves that sacrifices authenticity to minimize humiliation and prejudice. The massive, the massive task of our adult lives is to unpick which parts of ourselves are truly us and which parts we've created to protect us. Um, wow. So I, right? So I know <laughs> that like, um, that is a process that I have struggled with um, my entire adult life. Um, and I also know that during this pandemic, you know, one of the things as far as authenticity is um, that that connection is really important to it. And during this pandemic, we've had to rely on and we've had to find new and uh, creative ways to to foster connection. Um, and I think I've mentioned it to, to you, but, um, you know, with these holiday season, I told people that we were going to be wrestling or is going to be perceived that we were going to be wrestling with two things. Um, we were going to be wrestling with safety and, um, tradition and, mm -hmm. um, and that a lot of people were going to, uh, default to tradition instead of practicing safety. Um, and, you know, my thing is both of those can live in, in harmony um, and we can practice safety while also um, practicing tradition and establishing those connections with others. Um, and to authentically say to the other people, listen, I'm afraid of what is going on in this world, but I, I want to stay connected to you. How can we do that safely? Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's that. So what that tells us is authenticity is a process, right? It is a, um, uh, it is a action, right? Um, it's not something that, you know, like sometimes you hear people say, oh, he's so authentic. I would argue to disagree that like authenticity isn't something that we have or not have. It's a decision that we make. Um, and very much like uh, value systems that we have. Um, think about it kind of like a, uh, like a, like a compass. Um, you know, we have uh, these points on the compass, northwest, northwest, south, and east. Now, none of those um, directions we can be at, right? We can't be at north, and we can't be at west or south or east. We can go in the direction of north, south, east, west, right? And those are very much like our values, right? We're never going to be completely honest. We're never going to be completely vulnerable. We can't be those things. We can only um, take actions. Um, that let us know that we're headed in that direction, very much like a point on a map. Um, you know, like, you know, how do we know if we're headed east? Well, I know that I'm, or I know west, right? How do I know if I'm headed west? Well, I'm probably going to get to Pennsylvania, probably going to get to Colorado, right? That lets me know that I'm headed in the right direction. Um, <laughs> but, like, I'm never going to, you know, I'm never going to, like, be truly authentic because there's always going to be possibly a part of me that is, um, that is held back, whether by fear, shame, um, or, you know, sympathy or something. So my ego will sometimes, you know, sometimes always be there. Um, huh, so, um, so yeah, so that is, that's kind of my thing on authenticity. The, the one thing that, um, I want to go back to that you had uh, covered Ed was, you know, there, there's a lot to be said about being authentic. These, these concepts, um, you know, about being vulnerable, um, showing courage, you know, in times that we don't necessarily want to um, have people see who the who the real person is. And this particular item from um, Alexander Leon that you included is, I think, one of the. Uh, building blocks of the LGBTQ community, like in terms of mm -hmm. where we are and how we behave. And that I think when you kind of break it down, you'll understand that behaviors exhibited, that actions taken are rooted from something that kind of has to do with this. Mm -hmm. Meaning like, like we, because, and, and it could be different now, to us to a degree i don't know if it's going to be completely different but like a younger generation has more availability to live authentically than we did our generation in terms of our age and our time you know it was not okay to be out to be queer 
to be as open, um, you know, like this movie that like the movies I've watched the past couple nights are from, you know, the nineties. So, um, you know, there's this whole thing that about, uh, hate crime and the danger of being, you know, authentically yourself because you're going to be considered a faggot. You're going to be considered, you know, a queer or a homo. And, you know, that living with that fear is going to be, um, you know, the potential danger uh, of what you're you're facing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting, you know, that Alexander's pointing out, you know, that as we have become adults, one of our theoretical tasks in improving ourselves is like taking and understanding what we created in the past that we no longer need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, like, you know, these layers, you know, these barriers, these shelters, these walls, these whatever these things are. Um, you know, to to protect like the most um, inner uh, delicate, like soft tissue of who we are, because you know, we quickly learned like, oh, it's not okay to be, you know, queeny or girly or um, you know, to be interested in things that are not considered whatever our presumptive gender is you know based on society's norms mm -hmm. at the time like so all of that creates this thing that we have to protect ourselves um out of basically fear and yeah. now you know as an adult we're kind of coming into our own and figuring out like oh wow <laughs> that's messy yeah <laughs> yeah it's very funny i was talking yesterday with Jim about uh, high school for me and one of the things I'm realizing like I don't have a whole lot of like friends in high school from high school yes there's Facebook and I have some connections from like people from then that time but like genuine like people that I would talk to while I was when I was in high school are rare if any when I go back and think about it. And the main reason that was, at least on my part, was I was still, like, I was holding a lot back because I didn't want a whole lot of people to know anything that I was, you know, feeling at the time. Um, so, like, I go back now, I mean, a couple of years ago would have been my 20th high school reunion, and I'm realizing, like, I really didn't want to go. And I had to think to myself, why didn't I want to go? And the main reason was, as I thought about it, was, like, what I don't, I don't, re I don't think these people really know me, and I don't, and I will also kind of probably say that I probably don't really know them. Like, if you kind of pinpoint it down, like you know, there's probably been some changes in people. I had one friend who I remember, you know, who was probably the most, if I think now, like kind of the most authentic person um, there was because. She was um, she was a burn victim, and it was very like obvious what had happened. Mm -hmm. And she could not, you know, she couldn't get you know get away with it. If you know what I mean, like like it was something that was it was a trauma that was literally on her skin. And instead of being shy or timid or anything like that, she was very like friendly and nice and vocal and sweet. And um, I, 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 she's one of the few people that I remember like talking to and being friends with. We, we connected mostly through um, chorus and theater because um, I did theater in high school and she did too. And it was really nice connecting with her in those moments, but I realized like she probably really doesn't know me she might know parts of me mm. but she probably really doesn't know me and that feel felt weird to me um there were other things with her facebook that i wasn't a friend of because she kept like dropping off and then coming back on that it i was worried that she was like a bot like i knew it was her but like i was worried that because she kept like friending me and it was like oh i, I lost my password and, da, 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 da. and i'm like okay well uh, that's that's totally separate, but it was just one of these like moments where I was like, okay, I think I can't like I don't know what's going on here, so I'm just gonna kind of let it pass. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but these, this conversation, especially that quote from our twit, twit, (laughs) twit, (laughs) tweet, (laughs) woo, words are hard. It's morning. Hi. Um, uh, that tweet when that, like that, I remember seeing that a while back. Uh, oh yeah. It came out in July. Um, and I was just like, yeah, like, holy shit. Like that makes so much sense to like the lives, the life I have led and the life I am living like now. Um, I tell myself every time Cincinnati is probably the one city where I've been my most true self because it's the one place where I didn't have to worry about if someone sees me, if someone is from, you know, like, I, yeah, I went to college and yes, I went, you know, I lived in Louisville, but like it was the one city for the first time where I had like a fresh start. I didn't have to hide anything. I was already in working for a theater company. I had this whole, you know, I didn't have to worry about not being me because there was really nothing here to block me in a way, in some ways. I won't say fully. I mean, I was still 20 something when I moved here, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, and I think that's, you know, what you're talking about, Damon, is probably pretty common for individuals who found themselves like needing to create these these um protection spells Mm -hmm. i don't know what you want to call it like you know this way of walking about the world and i agree with you like i have never been to any of my high school reunions and i have uh, one coming up next year um and i was just thinking as you were talking i was like i don't i don't know if i'll go or not because i only really have like one true friend from that time in my life as a best friend and we're still in touch but we're not as close as we used to be but the reason why we were best friends is because both of us were living this the secrecy like both of us never talked about it until we both graduated high school and went off to college and in each of our respective freshman years because they're um uh separated uh an age behind me we both came out in our freshman year of college we never talked about like this aspect but we, it was just an unspoken thing. Like we were, you know, compatriots, like we were, you know, mm-hmm. chosen family without even knowing what any of that concept was. Um, we knew about each other. We were not attracted to each other. We didn't have interest in each other, but um, we, you know, we kind of went about living this, I don't know, you know, altered concept of, of, you know, this and, and trying to protect ourselves in some ways. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And now I'm like, nah, I don't know. And, and I'm, it's not that I don't care about those people, but they have no relevance in my life. Yeah. Um, in, in the present time frame. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like as you uh, age, <laughs> I was to say it, um, you know, you, you kind of shift, I think, your perspective and how you look at things. And, and um, that's why I'm curious to see if like in another 20 years, if the current youth generation will just have a very different like mm-hmm. aspect of themselves because they have, they have the opportunity to be more authentic with, without as much, um, I guess, uh, conflict in their lives, potentially. I'm not going to say it's completely gone because I'm not, I'm not foolish about that. Like there's definitely, yeah, true. Yeah. you know, people out there that are living in struggles because, you know, as much as we would like to be, you know, a utopian humanity, we are far from it. <clears throat> so. I know for me, um, uh, this past year has been a little eye-opening um, for me. Uh, and because um, I'm starting to realize just how kind of lucky um, I have been um, in my life. Uh, you know, you were both talking about high school um i've i have a bunch of friends from high school that i still talk to on a, on a regular basis and uh you know i'm maybe in the process of of even you know organizing a, a high school reunion but that wasn't always the case i i i have always kind of felt kind of scared about um the person who i was in high school um i felt i never felt like 
I was kind of living my, or I, I never felt validated mm. in, in who I was. And I, and a lot of that came from me and my own, um, own insecurities. So I think my journey has just always been about seeking validation from others, um, mm -hmm. to like, to, um, have you tell me that I'm okay. Yeah. And, um, and how that kind of what ended up happening is, um, I would, I would seek validation from anybody, <laughs> right? Mm, from so mm. many people, and that would that would take me away from relationships because I it was never enough. I never had enough, and you know, I I think that uh, a lot of you kind of know my history, right, um, with addiction and fact that I'm in I'm in recovery, and mm -hmm. I think one of the joys um, of the, these past eleven and a half years has been my journey towards authenticity of myself and, um, you know, validate and, you know, providing that validation for myself, but recently has been my awakening of just how much other people have always seen that. Um, and mm -hmm. I was the one who just didn't see it and trust it. Um, so when I read that quote, um, it was more about my inner um my inner armor that i created for myself that i didn't allow myself to validate myself um and you know uh um you know kind of always um engaging in relationships that i was never really satisfied in because they only saw me for what they wanted to see me um mm -hmm. and like me being like but I'm more than that, <laughs> you know? I'm like, uh, you are only seeing like happy-go-lucky Ed. Um, and that's something that I usually tell in my story is that um, there are three different versions of me. You either get Ed, um, Eddie, who's the performer, who's the performance, right? And then there's Edward, who's the professional and who's the recovering addict, right? Um, and the kind of the goal for me is realizing that they're the same person. Yeah. <laughs> I just I just create these these masks that they are different people, um, and but they're they're not they're they're exactly the same person. I think that's that's the process of authenticity for me is showing you that like I'm I'm all of these things. I'm not just the performer. I'm not just the academic. I'm not just you know this. I'm all of these things, and. Um, and I'm finding that there are people out there who see that. Um, yeah, yeah. And there are other people who don't. I mean, you just want a part of me. And that's, mm -hmm. I can't just be a part of me. That's not me living authentically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think a lot of entertainers um, grapple with that in some aspects because they create a persona, how they're viewed in their performance as their entertainment, um, whatever that may be. And yet there's still a human being behind all that. And I've, you know, heard repeatedly about, you know, the the challenge and the difficulty of when the public doesn't discern the difference between the two, or actually more importantly, I got that wrong, like that they don't that they don't blend them together. So like when they see someone in the public realm and they're not entertaining in the moment, mm -hmm. they're not seeing them as a human being, like who they are authentically, they're still applying this like filter over them as yeah. whoever they represent. Um, Damon, you and I know from like, you know, uh, all the years of uh, drag race, like, you know, yes, they are drag queens, they are entertainers, they are also people. Yeah. You know, they are also, you know, um, individuals that do this as an art form. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there's, there's multi, everybody's multifaceted. And I think that, um, our challenge or difficulty is, you know, with our human brains is, you know, we we really want to compartmentalize. We really yeah. want to label things. We really want yep. to, like, have a context and be like, oh, you know, okay. Yep. Um, it's... And so, you know, you look at somebody and you're like, oh, they're a whore. Well, yes, they're a whore, but they're a very fun whore. Like, they're, <laughs> they're fun to be around. You know, they are slutty, but, you know, they're more than that. Maybe they're a frontline worker. Maybe they're an essential worker. Maybe, you know, they work as a, a nurse in the ER. But, you know, mm -hmm. hello. Like, you yeah. know, just, just because, you know, this one thing about them, maybe they're, like, super kinky. That's great. And, yeah. like, I mean, that's that's what my life's journey has been about. Um, you know, I came out in, in 92 and then came out again in 99 
And it was more like the from 99 on that I was having the biggest um, experiences in terms of life lessons and being like, oh, like any person anywhere at any moment could present so much more than I was willing to mm -hmm. recognize about them because – you know, I had these experiences, you know, working at the campground for a couple of seasons was huge because these individuals would come in and they would be leaving their professional life, their home life, whatever that is. And they might feel more at liberty to be authentically themselves. Yeah. And so, you know, they're busy getting, you know, flogged or, uh, you know, railed openly in a public forum because they <laughs> want all the DNA inside them, whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, that'd be true. It's, it's right. true. And so I was like, huh, very, very interesting. But I've always been a person who wants to learn more. Mm -hmm. um, and I struggled a while in my 20s because I, I didn't <laughs> – it took me the longest time. And I still, even now in my 40s, find it a challenge at times when I'm like, why, why don't you want to be a better person? It's just – I don't know what it is about me. Maybe it's because of my life experience and, like, struggling with my own authenticity at a younger age that I'm, like, I always want to, like, be the best that I can be in the moment. But it's not a, it's not a trajectory, like a, like a line graph that goes from one part straight to the other. It's, you know, it's all over the place. Like, you have ups and downs and, you know, you, you do things that kind of maybe would be considered a setback and then you – go into something else. And in my 20s, I was like, I wanted to be a motivational speaker. I was going to be a life coach. Like, I was going to do that whole thing. Like, chicken soup for the soul, bitch. Like, I'm going to turn it out. <laughs> and, like, one of my best friends at the time was like, boy, you just don't get it. And I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, not everyone wants to be better. And I was like, what? Like, what do you, <laughs> what do you mean, like, people don't want to be better? Like, they don't want to improve themselves. And they're like, some people don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? They were like, yeah, they're like, people don't want to be proud. People don't want to be better human beings. Like, perhaps they're just trying to get through the day, through the moment. And it was like, it was a big awakening for me. It took me some time and I still from time to time struggle with it because I'm kind of like, what do you, <laughs> what, why don't you want to, <laughs> but then I'm like, not my journey. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, I, I agreed um, for the longest time. I had that feeling of what can I do? What can I help? How can I fix you in a way? Ooh. Girl, like, <laughs> let me tell you, like, sometimes <laughs> one, one, like, sometimes people just don't, I don't want to say don't want to be fixed, but sometimes they don't want to be fixed, if that makes sense. Like, they may want to do it on their own. They may want to, like, maybe get the help that they need or whatever, or they just don't want it. Um, and then the other part of it was you need to also take care of yourself because <laughs> maybe you should stop looking at other people to fix and maybe look at yourself because you're probably a little broken yourself. Like, cause yeah, I mean, fact, 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 um, probably not the most, um, you know, not broken pe person in the world out there, personally. Well, but everybody's broken in their own way. So I mean, yeah, some, some are really it's, broken. Some are just a little broken. And and I don't. And and then bit. I don't like using. I also don't necessarily believe like broken. I don't like using that word. But sometimes don't need to be. They don't need. Like you said, they don't need to be. Not everyone wants to be. Fixed. Nobody's perfect. Fixed. Nobody wants to be fixed. Some people just want to be heard. Yeah. Well, and, and that was the thing that my best friend at the time was trying to tell me was you want to solve problems for everybody. Like you want everyone to be self-empowered, like to, to show that they can achieve things, that they can improve their lives. And she's like, that's noble. Mm -hmm. It's also misguided. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I, like, I was like you, Gary. I think that's probably why we get along so well. Like I was, I wanted to be the problem solver. I wanted to like help people and all that stuff. And that was my big thing. And I don't think I had the friend that kind of was like corrected me, but I had the, the, it was a personal epiphany as I realized, like, I don't have, I, I can't expend all this energy on all these other people 
trying to help them and totally avoiding my own personal like shortcomings and problems and such. Like it was, it was, and also it is also mentally and physically draining on myself trying to help all these other people as well. Mm -hmm. And again, while it was like a noble gesture, I can't really, I couldn't really fully help if I didn't have the energy to do so. If I didn't have the, if I couldn't put the effort into it because I was so busy doing all of the, fixing all of these other people. Like it just, it, it, it wouldn't happen. It couldn't happen. Right. And I, I think that's part of the growth that mm -hmm. we may be blessed with when we realize like, I mean, I, I don't know how many times it comes back to this um, one concept. If you've ever flown on a commercial flight for an airplane, one of the instructions in the beginning is that in the event of an emergency and the oxygen masks are released, you put the mask on yourself first mm -hmm. and then you assist others around you, as in like your children and those that, you know, have, um, you know, uh, may not be as easily able to like apply the mask to themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think about this over and over again because I see people struggling in their lives through choices that they're making. And it's not that it's right or wrong, but I can understand the difficulty in which, you know, especially people who are first responders, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, emergency personnel, their their livelihood is saving others. It's it's trying to help others. And it becomes very difficult when you're expending and expending and expending and like you don't really get to refill. Mm -hmm. I was recently talking with um, some people about the concept of buckets and how, you know, like if you're an individual who, you know, is a giver, like, but like 2020 and specifically the pandemic with um, COVID-19 really taxed people in variable ways because, you know, we didn't get to refill those like those buckets those containers through interaction through socialization through you know um you know gatherings through being with other people and so at the end of the year i started to understand better i think where and i think we talked about this on the uh, recent episode like i spent most of the year working i worked two jobs i was very busy so i wasn't facing the depletion i think as soon but as the end of the year came I was like catching myself being like, wow, like I am tired and I am feeling like worn out and, um, you know, recognizing depression for what it is and that, you know, that the exhaustion and what kind of comes with that is this desire, this yearning, this like um, hunger for normalcy whatever normalcy is and mm -hmm. we as a modern society made normal being around other people often if not all the time and so to suddenly convert and be like no 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 everybody must silo go mm -hmm. don't go anywhere don't do anything you know it's potentially deadly is like a i think i don't know for certain i would call it a psychological schism like that's not like how we've operated you know we've always been um social as a species and we've developed all these things and then you know we <laughs> suddenly had to like convert and switch all that into a different um format and i think that is also you know a, a struggle for folks into who what where when um and if you're really going through a journey and trying to be your authentic self i mean okay let's add that to the mix Mm -hmm. you know, for <laughs> for challenges of what you're attempting to achieve. You know, if you're if you're a person who is is trying to live your best life, to be your authentic self, you know, and then uh, nature, quote unquote, or whatever you want to call it, is kind of like, sorry, gonna gonna throw you for a big looper or whatever mm -hmm. when it comes to that. Well, I think that like you know if we look at authenticity like a decision like a choice right we can always we have the we have control over that 
right? Like I can always choose to practice authenticity, whether with myself, whether with my relationship with others, whether with my job, whether with my hobbies, right? Um, like that is something I have control over. And um, I know that for me, when I'm feeling really stressed or when I feel like out of, out of the loop, out of control, um, I will resort back to what I know, right? Like mm -hmm. what is mine? Well, who am I? So like um, I have a playlist on Spotify that is my music that is not influenced by anybody else. That is music that I discovered on my own. And they are, that is music that speaks to me that reminds me who I am. Mm. Um, and because a lot of, uh, in my, in my journeys, right? Like if you look at my playlist or if you look at my, my Apple, uh, iTunes, um, it is, it is a collection of so many different people, right? Like, oh, I, I, I listen to this because of that person, or, you know, I do this because that person, um, showed me mm -hmm. this, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but when I want to return back to authenticity and who I am, um, I need to go back to like decisions that I made for myself, not influenced based on anybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, so like there's this, uh, group called Bears Den that I found, um, through like random on uh spotify and that's that's a group that i will listen to um because it's like kind of mine mm. that's fair i like that idea you know is essentially you know for some like many of us um we're influenced while we want to believe it or not a lot of us feel like we're, we're influenced by like our environment and outside pressures and, and music, especially is one of those ones that like some people are like really into pop music as an example. And some people are not. Um, some people just like, they like the like, I'll just use heavy metal as the example because it's one of the ones I know I'm not a big fan of. However, I know of like particular songs that I have found just randomly, like you're talking about that speak to me in ways that I didn't think I would understand that I don't like fully get or fully understand, but I'm like, I, this, I love this song and it's usually, it's not always, it's not always a popular song. Like sometimes it's like a B track on, if you remember, God. Oh, B tracks. I know, right. Ooh, that's some, there's some, that's some age. There. I saw that. I saw that <laughs> recognition go across the face. <laughs> you were like, and I just aged myself. Like, <laughs> So for the youth out there who don't know what we're talking about, <laughs> yes. uh, a long time ago in music uh, entertainment history, uh, songs would be released on a vinyl uh, 45 uh, mm -hmm. RPM album, uh, little uh, disc, so to speak, and you would have an A side and a B side. And the A side was pretty much the popular song. And then either the artist or the uh, production company would put another song on the B side. And it was mostly uh, that same artist. And it was a less popular song or a song they were hoping would be popular. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So then when we talk about A-sides and B-sides, it's like... In the, in that's one of that, the things. That's our old-timey reference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Look, I, I paid like almost $80 uh, for a B-side one time for one of yeah. my other songs. So yeah. B-sides are important. Yeah. And and they're and they're usually... Sometimes they're just they're just not... They're, they're not as popular. They're not as well known. And that's kind of what I mean. Like it's a song like from an artist that is, while you know they're like big, like popular works, it's these songs sometimes that are well, just like. A lot of the times they're exclusives. Yeah. Like and they're, the they're, only they're, way you can get it is by getting right. this single and it's on, on the B, B side. So mm -hmm. yeah, right. it, that's the only way of was, doing it. It's a collectible. It was. Yeah, sometimes it was produced, but the, like the album production company, whatever, they just didn't think it was a part of the bigger like EP or whatever. And so, yeah, I agree with you, Jeff. Like a B side is something you had to seek out, like you had to find. Like so, this movie recently watched. I was talking to my friends and I was explaining like the very first song at the very beginning of the movie is not on the soundtrack. It also mm -hmm. wasn't released anywhere else. And they were like, "What?" And I was like, "Yeah, like it's like weird." Mm -hmm. And 
you know, yeah. that's an example of how like, you know, things can exist, but also sort of not exist. Yeah. So here's, here's a, a, a good practice um, of authenticity is, you know, like, uh, if we want to make the choice to be authentic, we have to kind of know what we like and what we don't like, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and there comes a, a kind of a, like, vulnerability in there that, like, okay, so there is a song that I really like, Gary, okay? I really want to, I really want to share this song with you, Okay here is the song that I really, really like. And Gary's going to listen to it and he's going to say, that song was trash. I hated it. So like I'm sharing with you my authentic self and I'm getting vulnerable enough that I am <laughs> sharing that, right? And then Gary's like, uh, I don't like it, right? Uh -huh. old, old Edward, that would destroy old Edward mm -hmm. because I need, I need you to validate Mm -hmm. my likes and my my dislikes mm -hmm. and if gary doesn't like it then that must say that i am not worthy of connection then mm -hmm. like i feel shamed because i like this and um but like living a true authentic self would be like that's okay <laughs> right mm -hmm. um, yeah i know what i like and i know what i don't like just like gary's allowed to like what he likes and not what he likes, but it's just the practice of me sharing that with him mm. um, is me being authentic and him being authentic, uh, authentic to say, no, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I will caveat this as you decided to make me the guinea pig example. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't say this like, you know, while people are being authentic, there is a distinct difference between um, like being brutally honest and delivering the same message, but couching it like in a way that the that the receiver can like be more receptive to it, so to speak. Um, like you know what you know like, and I'm just like, picking. Trash. I know, but I'm just picking it because you're like, you know, this is, this is trash. And I was like, I don't know if I would say it was trash. Like I don't even know if I would have said it when I was younger, but I probably would try really hard because of my desire to be accepted. Um, you know, mm -hmm. to say to the other individual, um, okay, like it's not really my cup of tea, but you know, Mama, this is garbage. Yeah. Like, like, no! <laughs> why do you come for me so? <laughs> Look, I know it's garbage. That's the name of the band. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. They're referencing yeah, so, my favorite band. They, they name is garbage because they garbage. Like, what What do you want me to say? How do you want me to feel about it? <laughs> you know, I, I, I used to say say that when my brother was trying to expose me to the band Garbage way back during their first album. Mm -hmm. it, it, they had the, the, the song Stupid Girl. Uh, a friend of mine in high school ended up changing my opinion of it. And now I absolutely adore them. Yeah. So that's like, that's a good practice of authenticity. Like usually music's a good one, right? Because like we hold music very mm -hmm. sacred to ourselves or movies or, you know, something that's really important to us. Um, and um, we absorb or make a part of us, I would say is, is part of that. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Ed, but I was just thinking about food. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but like, have you ever had the experience where like you share something with somebody else and they don't like it and you feel upset, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that that is an example of you kind of experiencing fear of um, not not being connected. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, you know, I, I because we do those things because we want to be connected to others, right? Like I did that with a with a client earlier um, this week. Um, you know, they were telling me about a, a musical that they really like. And I was like, oh, well, let me share with you another musical that I think that, that you would like if you like this, right? And in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, my gosh, they're going to tell me that they don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. What uh, but that's kind of my, my need for validation. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So, like, also with living authentically, we need to know what our strengths and our weaknesses are. Um. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And own that, right? So, like, one of my weaknesses is that, you know, sometimes I I seek for validation from others. Mm -hmm. And you might go to certain lengths to get that validation, too. Maybe not so much anymore, but you there's that's part of it. 
Mm-hmm. I yeah. find it. I find it interesting Ed, that you view it that seeking validation is a weakness because I really want to strongly rebuttal that and be like, no, I think that's a strength. Like to, to know that about yourself, that validation is important and that you, you want that or need that for whatever reason. Like, I think that that can also be a strength, I guess. I don't know. For me, it's a weakness because, um, kind of in that mask thing, then I'm not being true to myself because <laughs> I want to pr- I want to project this version of myself that I think you're going to like. So I'm mm-hmm. going to change things about myself that I know you're going to agree with, right? And then like like that's happened where I have um uh you know projected this performance idea of who I am and then um when I come to you with some kind of like intimacy or some kind of like vulnerability and you are like yeah i'm not that's not kind of what i want from you right so when i when i look for validation from you you know and you don't give that to me yeah that's that can be hurtful it can (laughs) i'm struggling with it because because here's what i'm thinking of and and i'm probably going to deeper or further than other individuals will be when I am able to see that someone is seeking validation, I see that not as a weakness, but as a strength of who they are because they are being vulnerable with me. Does that make sense? Like, so, if yeah, I can, so, if so I can that recognize would be the difference that. between vulnerability and validation, right? Like, I can be vulnerable with you and you can validate me, but like, uh, I feel like an authentic. If I was being authentic, I wouldn't need that from you, you know, like, but that would be a natural, that would be a good representation of like a healthy relationship with you that like, I'm, I'm coming to you with some kind of like vulnerability and you are receiving that and you are reflecting that back to me. That would be, that would be positive. Right. But if I come to you and you're like, no bitch, get away from me. Right. Like, um, that's, that, that's not what I want from you right now. Right. That wouldn't be really a a true healthy relationship. And I guess like and this is probably semantical. Like if someone comes to me and is seeking validation, I think that's authentic. Like that is truly who they are in that moment. It doesn't mean that they are like uh, that they have something going on that they need that validation. Like I'm not d- ignoring that or dissuading that or whatever. I'm seeing it as like I guess it's more about like I I'm maybe I'm authentically accepting them for all that they are flaws and all I don't know like am I making sense Yeah mm-hmm. but but I think that like where some my weakness is is if I don't get that validation from you like so um you know say something's going on and I feel bad about myself or whatever and I'm coming to you and I'm saying hey listen I'm feeling kind of I'm not feeling great right I'm feeling like I'm really scared about these things right and um, if you don't validate that, then that means that, to me, um, that I'm a bad person, that mm. that there's something wrong with me. Um, does that make sense? It does. I guess I've I'm in a different place in my life now that I would, I would not, not validate. <laughs> like I would. <laughs> validate what like i wouldn't contradict you know or or make or try to give you any negative feedback like in the seeking of the validation i would be like i think it's perfectly normal to you know be scared about this thing whatever it is well then you're a very compassionate person i just want everyone to love me um (laughs) (laughs) so but so you also have to know like who you're but you also have to know who you're going to like um, I think that sometimes we go to to others to to seek validation from them, but like that isn't kind of the basis of the relationship. So like um, I I know that I've said this in here before. Don't go to the hardware store for bread, right? So like if you're not getting validation from, or if you're not getting kind of what you need from the other person, um, go somewhere else, right? Um, because sometimes that may not be the um, the nature of the relationship or like, you know, that may, may not be a strength of the, that, that one person, but you know, you can find that elsewhere. So Mm -hmm. I just realized something. I just had an epiphany when people come to me seeking validation, it validates me. Oh, boom. 
Mm. Because if they're seeking me for validation, that ups my value and my worth. And Ooh, you may want to look at that. And <laughs> girl, this is not a session for everyone to be a witness to. Um, <laughs> no, but like, like I've known this about me. Like, like I'm a I'm a people's pleaser to a certain point. I'm a big like problem solver. Like I want to help others like get through their whatever their thing is. And I've had to say to some of my closest friends when sometimes we've had a, like a you know, kind of angsty situation arise because they're coming to me. I immediately have a tendency to go into fixing mode or problem solving mode is usually what I call it. And it's kind of like, you know, when in reality, maybe they just want to vent. And I've had to say to them, I'm like, if you just want to vent, like you just want to talk and you don't want me to help, you have to tell me that mm. because I'm not going to presume you want me as a sounding board. Like you just want to be, you want me to be the void that all of this comes into. I don't work that way. Like I can but I have to be prefaced. Like I have to be instructed and be told, you know what? I just need you to listen. I don't want your help. I don't want your feedback. And I don't want you to problem solve. Cool. Mm. Thank you for letting me know. If you don't let me know, bitch, I'm going to come up with 17 different ways that you possibly could have looked at it at a different <laughs> angle. Did you consider this? What about this other thing? What about these resources? Probably because I felt I didn't have that. Mm. There you go. And therefore, I've kind of made it part of my life's work to be like, I'll do what I can, as I can, because nobody did it for me. But to be fair, nobody knew. Yeah. Because I didn't feel I could be authentic. I didn't think I could be honest and open, and thereby I closed myself off. I projected a different kind of thing. And then when I started becoming my my true self, I guess that's really what I'm seeing in other people is since I know the pain of not being validated and not being authentic – I'm probably feeling like I'm a magnet to that in other people and that I'm empathetic with that. And like, and there ergo, like I want to help other individuals because like it, it's good for them, but it's also a part of my narcissistic view or whatever that I want to be valid. You know, they're validating me by seeking me out as a person who helps others. Mm. Yep. Mm, 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 Put that mm. in your hat. True. So, um, so I got like some questions here. Um, yeah. And these are like just some questions um, for people to explore their own authenticity. Um, and I kind of mentioned it before, but I'll just run through these. And you know, if there's any of these that kind of resonate with you and you want to explore for yourself, um, like so. They are like, so what is my greatest strength? What is my greatest weakness? What is my proudest achievement? What is my greatest failure? What am I worried about? Now, that can be a um, uh, sometimes a difficult question. So the way that I present it to people is I will say, think about a room where all of your worries live. What do you see? Mm -hmm. um and then i will say what you know uh so kind of moving on so like what do i believe in what are my values and that's really important to me because in order for me to head in the direction that i need to go um i need to know what is important to me um also what am i interested in that i haven't tried how are my relationships what do i like and dislike about my job what does my inner critic tell me is your inner monologue more critical than not? And I know when I'm stressed when I finish the, you know, fill in the blank. Mm. <laughs> this reminds me when I was younger, this gives you insight as to how like complex puzzle minded I am when I was younger. And we actually did this on the podcast very briefly. I think there are two books called The Book of Questions. And mm -hmm. they're probably still in print now, but one of them was called The Book of Questions and the other one is called The Book of Questions, Love and Sex, I think. And they're just literally that. It's literally hundreds of questions and there's no answers to them. Like you just read the question and it's uh, theoretically, you know, the, the concept is to be introspective or to ask it of others. And the idea I think that was presented by the person who, who wrote them, I think the author might be a PhD, was as a way to get to know other people. 
Like mm-hmm. if you were going to establish a relationship with a person, here's some random questions that you can ask them. And some of them are difficult. Like they're they're intentionally very deep thought provoking. You know, like if you had the ability to live your authentic best life with all the finances you've ever dreamed of, but one person had to die, would you pick that life? Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what I mean by like very deep and very thought provoking, <laughs> like, you know, um, but there were other ones, you know, like, you know, do you have a preference for being up at, in the morning or up at night? Like, you know, so it was kind of all over the place, but that was, you know, something that I latched onto uh, when I was a young adult and I was kind of like, wow, this is fascinating. But, you know, I just have a, a thirst for knowledge and like understanding the way people kind of like think and process things. So, yeah, it seems like you have a, you have a, um, you really like to be connected to others. Oh, of course I do. No. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but here are some other ones. So like, this is specifically geared towards relationships with with others. But like, you know, kind of what Brene Brown talks about is authenticity often um, shows up in our relationship with others um, because that's kind of what what feeds authenticity is connection. So, um, so the prompt is to think of a recent experience with a partner, friend, family member, or coworker where you wanted to be authentic, but you weren't. Um, imagine pausing at the height of this interaction and asking yourself these following questions. What am I afraid would happen if I shared my experience right now with this person? How will I feel if I don't share what I'm thinking and feeling? If I weren't afraid... What would I most want to say to this person right now? Mm-hmm. And how can I share this? How can I share this with even more vulnerability? My favorite one is the if I weren't afraid, what would I most want to say to this person right now? Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. Now that's the question. I'm just yeah. gonna say that right now. That is a question. Because yeah. <laughs> it's the, you know. You have like it it is that ultimate to me ultimate vulnerability is just like what would I say to you if I'm gonna I'm gonna be blunt what would I say to you if I gave no fucks Mm. Mm -hmm. like (laughs) like what 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 would what would I what would happen if I didn't like not say didn't care but like I didn't fear the consequences of being true. Are truthful, are authentic. That's ever. exactly it, David. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. it, the consequence is the key word, right? Mm-hmm. If I have if I have no regard for the consequence of an action, some people would say like it's reckless. Others would say it's authentic. Some might say it's bold mm-hmm. or brave or courageous because mm-hmm. they are just without concern. Um, mm-hmm. without caution, yeah. you know, these, these things that, you know, we've been sort of talking about in various ways today that, um, you know, you are willing to do whatever that thing is, um, in that moment. Yeah. You, you yeah. know, it's kind of strange as I, I look at these, these questions and I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, uh, yeah, I ask this all to myself in regards to any interaction that I have with my team lead at at work. Mainly because one, I have to think of it in a work environment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and two, I realize that uh, she has no, at least from my perspective, uh, she has no empathy nor tact. Uh, I, I have Ooh. to. I, I have oh. to. Like every time I want to complain to her about something or about a way she has said something, I have to think very carefully of how I'm going to word it in order to avoid her not being able to understand it because of these, these things already. Mm. I mean, I, I really wish I didn't have the supervisor. The only thing is I'm having trouble communicating uh, or thinking of the appropriate words to, to be able to, uh, communicate it to my manager to be like, I really want to change teams because this is the She's reason the why I don't like like her as a team lead. There are plenty of people who are 
totally okay with her as a team lead. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I don't fault them for that. But me and her just don't get along. There are just, just there, there's things that just drive me up the wall with her. And, and I, I can't get past it. The only thing is how do I communicate that appropriately in a business environment um, and be able to be like, you know what? If I was on this team leads team or this team leads team, or even this team leads team, any of the other three team leads, I'd probably be in a much happier position, despite the fact that I'm currently, the hours I'm currently working right now. Um, but the only problem is I ha the the main problem I have right now is I don't know how to communicate that effectively. Like how to, <clears throat> how to, for lack of a better word, verbalize that, which it won't necessarily be verbal for the most part. It's going to be mostly textual. And then maybe they would have a meeting. We would have a meeting and then I would have to verbalize it. And it's just mm -hmm. like, she's like, all I, all I can think of is she drives <laughs> me up the wall. <laughs> I, my perspective is showing, ta showing tact. And well, I was going to say, Jeff, like, uh, like I have an immediate supervisor that I'm not thrilled with mm -hmm. um, personally because um, they're not a leader. Mm. And that's very challenging for me as a subordinate because I want someone to make me better. And when I get nothing, like – that's not helping like in, mm -hmm. in, in what I, what my desire is. But I've also struggled with supervisors who I thought were incompetent. And I was like, why am I smarter than you? Like, why do I know more than you? That's, and that's the, and while that comes across as ego and I own that it is partially ego, but when, when, when facts are facts and I know policy better than you and I do things better than you, um, <laughs> you know, you kind of, you kind of wonder about stuff. But what I've realized is, um, <laughs> yeah, it is Shane David. Uh, you know the 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 truth is, I usually where I I realize I I need to take stock of the moment is like you're talking about like asking these questions, but truly like saying to myself like okay, how do I modify my current behavior to meet them where they are, like to. Uh, address whatever that is and as one of my best friends um, came out as uh, autistic to me in the past year and we have been friends for decades mm -hmm. but because of our friendship like I wasn't necessarily able to see it but since that revelation and, and they're coming out basically to me um, and getting tested and you know and actually uh, having a, a diagnosis I'm like wow like now I, I i and i'm not trying to rewrite our context of our history but i remember moments in which i was like not uh, sure what was happening or what the miscommunication was and then realizing like oh neither of us in this moment understood a a, a, a reality that was unknown mm -hmm. <laughs> and and it's that unknown like thing that really can shift your perspective i guess um and maybe you'll you know maybe i will never come to understand my direct supervisor truly that's okay i'm just working within the the confines of whatever the established relationship is it's mm -hmm. one of those things where, where it, it it's it falls under the category of things you don't know that you don't know mm -hmm. yeah because there's things that you don't know that you don't know there's things that you know that you don't know there's things that you know that you know and things that you don't know that you know <laughs> thank you landmark yes, forum for teaching me this if you don't know now you know yeah so i think um this is really good stuff for for people to consider um, and pursue, you know, in their own uh, time and place if they want to. And uh, Mr. Edward, you gave us a whole series of resources for folks to consider. I think that um, are pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And some of these, I think, are you said are the are they these some of these are the podcast episodes? Yeah. So um, 
I mean, 90% of them are Brene Brown, but, um, (laughs) you know, they really go over um, a really, it's a really good survey of, uh, you know, references on authenticity from Brene Brown, right? Talking about, um, so the first is a CNN article um, on authenticity written by her. Um, The next is uh, actually really cool. So it's a, Brene Brown's definition of empathy versus sympathy, um, which I think people confuse often. Um, and you know, we talked about the fact that sympathy um, gets in the way of connection. Um, so it's a, it's a really cool animated video. Um, so I highly recommend that. Um, the next is her book, The Gifts of Imperfection. In the first chapter, talks about authenticity. A lot of what we talked about today. Um, The next is like her viral video, her viral TED talk, um, The Power of Vulnerability, that I refer to every single one of my clients needs to watch this. Mm. Um, Then we have the the questions that we asked, the four questions, um, and then the two podcasts with Alicia Keys and Joe Biden. So I think kind of leading up to um, this week, it would be a really good idea for people to listen to that um, because it really kind of shows a really good... um, side of him that uh that i think people would really benefit from kind of going into this week um it's very healing uh and then finally you know the 10 questions that we asked before um to help reveal or get closer to making choices um towards authenticity and all of these will be linked on the website to, to, yeah. to just let you know so um uh, as soon as the podcast posts to the public and actually for you patrons we'll get it early um you, you'll have links to that i'll make sure the videos are embedded so you can just watch it right there so nice i don't know about you but that sounds like that's the end oh mm plenty of ways to contact us pop over to our website comes out live.com you can, where you can get the links to all these resources uh to be your authentic self uh you can shoot us an email it comes out loud at gmail.com leave us a voicemail six or otherwise at 361 col talk that's 361-265-8255 be your authentic self in your voice uh you can follow us on various social media outlets at instagram facebook tumblr twitter and youtube or join our entourage chat at tinyworld.com slash telegram dash col uh if you would like to know when we're currently planning to record these you can pop over to our google calendar at tinyworld.com slash calendar dash col which you can subscribe to that uh you can also get various uh accoutrements such as the sloppy bottom 23 shirt or a consent is my foreplay shirt. Sorry, Various different styles and colors. <laughs> Over at zazzle.com slash comes out loud. Uh, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash comes out loud and get the links to these resources early. Uh, you can also just send us some cash to help us improve our podcasting ability uh, by going to paypal.me slash comes out loud. You can uh, rate us and subscribe to us through Apple Podcast, uh, Google Play, Spotify, Amazon, Audible. Uh, and you can find me anywhere as, in, on the internet as uh, Box Up, Box Puppy, Box Cup, Box Up Your Other, and Windgem, W-Y-N-G, W-Y-N-D-G-E-M, over on Twitch, where we have Bears and Dragons and me streaming a lot of WoW. Nice. Um, if you wish to get in touch with me, you can find me as Theater Cub Seven Nine on both most most wow blah, 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 blah. most bear related sites. There's the phrase. Are on Facebook. Or you can find me as Pup underscore Umbra on Twitter. Um, the Twitter is definitely not safe for work. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as Gabriel Seventy Three on Twitter. Uh, if you want to see stuff that is. Um, kind of like Damon, a mix of a variable things, but mostly not safe for work. Uh, it's Gerber 73 xxx And uh, Ed, as our illustrious guest, if people would like to follow you online, reach out, get in touch, ask you questions, further discussion, you know, book an appointment. Flirt, 
flirt with you. Employment. Right, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so you can find me on uh, Facebook with just my name, Edward Angelini Cook. Um, you can also go to my website at eactherapy.com. Um, I also have a, a, a Facebook and Instagram um, as EAC Therapy LLC. Um, my Instagram is Unicub underscore Sex Brain Wizard. And um, uh, Twitter, you can follow me on Eddie H. Cook. Um, I also have an NSFW page, but you can message me privately for that. <laughs> I don't know who's listening and, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. found- <laughs> it's, it's it's all good. All good. So, sometimes you have to be cautious. In any case, mm-hmm. say good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Bye, everybody. everybody. <laughs> Ciao for now.